Apex is brought to you by IG, the world leading online trading and investments provider. Welcome. You're listening to the Trading Global Markets Decoded podcast with Daily FX. I'm your host, analyst and editor at Daily FX, Martin Essex. We bring you trading insights on the world's biggest market, the $5 trillion a day FX market, as well as commodities and other key assets, while describing the opportunities that may be emerging around the world. Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon. Good evening, depending upon where you are in the world. And welcome to this podcast. With me today is Roger Lowenstein, who reported for The Wall Street Journal for more than a decade. His work has also appeared in The Washington Post, Bloomberg, The New York Review of Books, Fortune, The New York Times Magazine and many other publications. His books include Buffett, When Genius Failed, Origins of the Crash, While America Aged and The End of Wall Street. Roger, welcome. Uh, Martin, it's a pleasure to be with you. Roger, let's start with financial crises, which you've written about extensively. I guess the the key question is, do you think there will be another financial crisis anytime soon? Well, you know, Martin, the thing about crises is the the reason they're crises is they're unexpected and sudden. If, if, If somebody came down and told us, you know, you've got two years to prepare for the next crises, I, I presume, and we believe them, I presume that somebody would take them half seriously and then there wouldn't be a crisis. So they're just, you know, for that reason, they're very, um, they're very, very uh, hard to predict. There, there were a few people um, uh, who did predict the mortgage uh, crash of, uh, in this country, uh, you know, 2007, 8, 9, and, and sort of, uh, you know, followed in fashion in, in England and, and elsewhere a year or so later, I guess. But, uh, but most people didn't take them seriously, not even the Federal Reserve, you remember, you know, which had all this data and information and so on. Uh, they thought uh, subprime would be uh, containable and that it wouldn't in any case infect uh, the larger financial system or the economy. Uh, you know, that said, I don't see anything like a, um, uh, a classic bubble. Uh, that we had in uh, in mortgages, or that you know we had in uh, in dot coms. Although I'll say that, that that some of the venture capital looks pretty pricey, and and I don't think WeWork will be the last uh, venture firm to be revalued, shall we say? And uh, even some of those who've gone public, such as Uber, have been uh, you know the, the the Silicon Valley expectations have been markedly ramped down. But but. Um, uh, because there are those who say that that you know there is bound to be a financial crisis at some point. The only real question is when that will be. Well, that's right, but that's you know that's that's a pretty easy prediction to make. <laughs> the the, the, the I, I was going to say that the, the the trouble with predictions of crashes isn't isn't that we don't get enough positives. That we get too many positives. You know the old line about predicting a nine of the last four recessions. <laughs> yes. So if you're if you're if you go back and look at uh, what people said uh, before the mortgage crash. There were a lot of people saying uh, there is too much debt, someday we're going to have a crash, and so on. It, it, to me, it really only counts if you predict with specificity. Uh, you know, there's always a lot of debt out there. And ever since I joined the Wall Street Journal early in my career and in the very end of the 1970s, books used to come in uh, talking about the next debt crisis, the next financial crisis, and they stack up on the shelf. It, 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 unless you've really identified, no, this asset class, no, this form of debt, you know, you're, you're, uh, every stop clock is, is right uh, twice a day. So I, I don't tend to, uh, tend to pay much attention to predictions of crashes un- unless, as I say, that with specificity, somebody has said, uh, hey, uh, people are getting subprime mortgages uh, without having to declare their income and so on. And, and then you've got some um, meat on the bones that you, that you really evaluate. Okay, so um, let's say that there's not going to be a financial crisis, hopefully for a while. Yeah, I didn't means- say that. I just said <laughs> I guess that I'm not positioned to identify it and predict it. Oh, fair enough. Um, so in the meantime, are you expecting another recession, which I guess is more frequent? And if so, what do you think will cause it? Trade with Daily FX parent company IG for low spreads, intuitive platforms, and round-the-clock customer care. 
Learn more at IG.com today. Well, I, I guess you're asking about the United States. Uh, uh, at least that's the situation I know best. Let's go for the uh, U.S. then. Yeah. My immediate answer would be no. The economy is uh, pretty robust, you know, adding jobs. Uh, wages are ticking up. Uh, someday there'll be a recession for sure. I, I would think the most uh, likely uh, cause would be uh, uh, overconfidence, including overconfidence on the part of the Federal Reserve. And you could get, uh, you know, at some point, some very um, sharp uh, increases in wages and, and they could... Uh, factor into the uh, economy and and you could get some pretty nasty upticks in inflation and I, and there's certainly uh, there's certainly an argument that the Fed in raising rates uh, several times this year uh, was somewhat cavalier about that risk uh, because uh, it did so even in a I would say a consistently good not great economy uh, and in a, con in a in a climate of rising wages, I mean, rising wages has a a very good uh, offshoot uh, in this country right now because because uh, people have been waiting so long, particularly people below the upper crust, for a good wage, and most people want them to have a good wage. But but you know, if you get into all of a sudden four or five percent uh, wage increases, which certainly could happen. Uh, the Federal Reserve might have to then suddenly pull back, uh, and 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 that has caused many recessions in the past. And I think that to me that'd be the most likely uh, uh, cause of one. You know, when you travel outside of urban centers, particularly in the U.S., uh, you see one consistent economic problem, and that's a shortage of labor. Uh, things like uh, general stores and uh, other sorts of um, employers they have trouble getting help. Uh, some of them in rural areas are closing because they they can't get help, and uh, so there's no doubt wages are rising, and uh, at, at some point the Fed uh, might have to undo the the uh, rate cuts and and go even more strongly in a, in a higher rate direction, and uh, uh, that would be my bet for the the cause of the next recession whenever it comes. Mm. Now changing subject completely. You've also written extensively about Warren Buffett, the um, American investor and philanthropist. What is your opinion of him? Well, he's terrific. Um, you know, he's, uh, what, what, what I really uh, 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 admire about uh, Buffett, uh, a few things. Uh, one is, what, what he does uh, is something that the average investor can do uh, reasonably well if they pay attention. I, I don't mean that 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 you should quit whatever it is, your day job if you're listening, you know, run out to Omaha, Nebraska, start a company and expect to become a billionaire. That's not likely. But um, what he said is if you, uh, to distill it, uh, if you focus on just a, a few securities where you have either expertise or some uh, good grounding, what he says, stick to your circle of competence and evaluate them as businesses, uh, not as a trading token uh, sliding across your screen, not as trading uh, vehicles, but as businesses. And think about what you'd want to pay to own that business. And, and then just, uh, and, and when the opportunity comes along so that they're priced at a, a reasonable discount to that value, and then just hold it. Uh, you're going to do reasonably well, and that's a uh, that's a formula, rather not a formula. That's an approach that uh, the uh, ordinary investor uh, can apply, and, and and many have. And it's so commonsensical, and it's it's devoid of um, uh, what I'd call uh, excessive ambition or greed that that leads to so many mistakes. It's it's not based on uh, uh, taking advantage of somebody else. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's not speculating that you're getting the timing right, which has got to mean then that the person on the other side of the trade is getting the timing wrong. It's what we used to call investing, you know, investing in a, in a business's prospects. And uh, it's, it all sounds simple. It sounds so logical when, uh, uh, when you say it, 
but 90% of the people listening are going to nod and, and then go out and look at what the 90 day moving average is. <laughs> when you're buying a business, you're not looking at the 90 day moving average. You're thinking about the products, uh, the competition, the, the market size and so on. And that's really what matters. And that's what he's been doing day in and day out for uh, 60, 60, 60 so years now. Uh, so yeah, I mean, he's now known, isn't he, as a long-term investor, as you say, and and people yeah, do. He's a long-term investor. I think he's yeah. you got to give him that. And, and people do indeed flock to Nebraska to listen to what he's saying. But this side of the Atlantic, he's known as the man who um, shorted the pound and made quite a lot of money out of that. I mean, that wasn't really a long-term investment, was it? Well, I, th I think that was George Soros, actually. Uh, ah, you're quite right. Yes, indeed, so, you're quite right. So yep. Soros yep. is also you know, he's, um, they're, um, politically, uh, uh, somewhat similar. I, you know, you, you cued off by talking about the philanthropist and there's certainly that, uh, uh, dimension to Buffett, but of course, Soros is, is a fabulous, uh, philanthropist and, and coming out of Eastern Europe, he had, I think, a, a particular empathy with, um, uh, you know, those societies still behind the Iron Curtain and now emerging and, 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 and trying to reestablish themselves as democracies. Well, for that matter, Britain and the U.S., they're trying to reestablish themselves as democracies. But so I think Soros has the is more the short term trader with uh, uh, a, a giant shadow as a philanthropist. And Buffett uh, over in Omaha is is the long term uh, value investor. Have you actually met uh, Warren Buffett? No, so yeah, sure. When I when I um, when I did the book, I met him um, a bunch of times, and uh, and at, over the years at annual meetings and so on, I've talked to him, and and uh, occasionally for an article or a book, I've called him. But my first experience with him, you know, I hadn't met him when I decided to the book, and uh, I was very excited. I got this. He wasn't very well known then. Um, just becoming well known. This is when he engineered the rescue of uh, an investment bank, Solomon Brothers, uh, in New York. So uh, I had uh, a contract, and uh, I wrote him a letter and, and said, you know, basically, hi, you know, my name is Roger Lowenstein. I'm going to be your biographer, and and here's when I'd like to get together with you, and you know, I'd like to see you in your office, and, and you know, when you're on the road, and and we'll do some interviews together. And you know, I had a whole I had a whole schedule laid out. And he, he just wrote back and said, no, thanks. And that was it. <laughs> um, and and uh, I, I remember that uh, a couple of people said, well, you know, you'll bring him around or something. But you, you could tell that pretty quickly, and this was sort of an object lesson of the person I was writing about, he, he didn't spend a lot of time uh, rethinking decisions he had made. Um, but um, he, was, um, he wasn't hostile. He didn't try to... Uh, block his friends or associates or even his family members from from talking to me and most of them uh, ended up uh talking to me and, and then i would run into him when i was talking to one of his associates in his office or uh, at an annual meeting or a lecture he was giving and uh, he's a uh, you know he's if you've ever seen him on tv he's extremely quick he's extremely uh, witty uh i would say he's guarded if if he wants to tell you something he'll tell you and if, if he doesn't it doesn't matter how you approach him or sneak up on him or take the, he's going to spot you a mile away and, and, and he's, he's, he's going to talk about what he wants to talk about. And that's, that's it. Did you actually like him? I did like him. I did like him. Um, uh, he's, um, as I say, he's very funny. Uh, I think he's a, a thoroughly um, uh, decent uh, human being. Uh, you know, when you study somebody close up, uh, particularly when you meet their family and so on, there's a, uh, when you have that sort of genius and obsessive focus, it certainly takes away from uh, other aspects of your life. And I, I don't think it was the easiest, and I go into this in detail in the book, but it wasn't the easiest thing to be uh, Warren Buffett's uh, uh, son or daughter or, or, or even spouse. Uh, you just, you know, you don't, you don't, um, you don't get to be Mozart uh, by uh, having all sorts of hobbies and taking vacations and, uh, you're just you're just writing those symphonies, as he, as he said, painting the canvas. And that was one of the the more interesting parts of the research was learning about the interplay between his work and his genius and his life. Because he, it's it's not a job you do nine nine to five. I think I said in the, in the book that that 
the way he felt about Berkshire Hathaway. That's the company he's run since 1965. You know, it was, it, it, it's like how Churchill felt about England. It just doesn't stop. It was his life. So, um, uh, but I, I, I did like him and, and, um, and I do like him. Is he a controversial figure in America in the same way that George Soros is? Well, Buffett's not controversial in this Soros way uh, because uh, Soros is far more out there politically. Uh, Buffett is certainly liberal. Uh, and in Buffett's case, it's interesting because his father was a conservative congressman. I mean, very conservative. Back in the, you know, he was an opponent of the New Deal back when there weren't many of those, when the you know FDR was getting us through the depression and Buffett grew up uh, as a, as a conservative uh, Republican, but he broke uh, in the sixties as he was uh, coming into his own as a young man, basically on the issue of civil rights. He, you know, as, as a value investor and as an investor, he just was so beholden to the idea of merit, uh, not based on, uh, you know, well, certainly not on skin color and just, 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 you know, merit, achievement based on success. And, and, and the Republican Party was uh, dragging its foot on civil rights, so he broke from it. I, I, I don't think Buffett is, um, you know, that's, that's hardly controversial today. Uh, everybody knows Buffett's a Democrat, but, you know, there are lots of Democrats. Um, uh, he takes positions uh, such as he's uh, quoted quite frequently saying that the rich should pay uh, uh, higher taxes. That's not a very controversial position today either. Uh, and unlike so many Wall Street figures, um, there really isn't a lot of tar on him, you know, in terms of uh, bad deals or, or uh, uh, taking advantage of, of folks. So, you know, as public figures go, and so many of them get tarnished, I, I would say he's relatively not controversial. Okay. Now, I see that you're a director of the Sequoia Fund, which, okay. like Buffett, is a long-term investor. Does that mean you think that investment, I mean, do you agree with him that investment has to be for the long term? Yes, I do. I, I, look, if, if, if I asked you, you know, if I pointed to 10 stocks on the, on the uh, financial page of the, of the Financial Times and, and asked you to pick the, the three you knew best, and then said, uh, you know, Martin, in, in, in three or four years, would you think these three would be higher or lower? You'd probably be able to give me, at least for those three, some informed opinion. If I said, Martin, you know, at, at 3 p.m. today, will they be higher or lower? I mean, you know, goodness, you, you, you couldn't give me an answer, or even, even three weeks or even three months. It's just a sort of a gyration, uh, you know, a, a, a fluctuation that, that, that is essentially random. It doesn't mean you can't do that, but it's just, I don't call it investment. I call it speculation. And that's, you know, that's, that's something that's a very common and popular pastime. And I, I just distinguish it from, from investment. Is the Sequoia Fund successful? Yes. The Sequoia Fund has had, uh, it's actually, we're going to celebrate our 50th year, uh, uh, next uh, 50th anniversary, uh, in uh, 2020, next year. Congratulations. Uh, and, uh, it's several points over that span, a span of 50 years ahead of the S&P. So that's you know, the number of funds, A, that are still above ground, and B, that have that kind of record. Uh, 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 check the figures to make sure I'm accurate before you, uh, uh, before you <laughs> know. Uh, I don't want to get in trouble with the SEC. But but I know it's ahead of the averages, and, and that's over a, uh, a quite substantial period of time. With me today is Roger Lowenstein, financial journalist. Um, Roger, your latest book is about the creation of the Federal Reserve. Um, do you think that by and large it's been a success, or is it time that it was reformed? Well, at first I thought you meant the book, and I was going to say, yes, it's been a success. <laughs> and, um, that too. Look, the Fed has been uh, in the process of uh, reformation uh, almost throughout. It was created by an act of Congress. It's it's not the Constitution or anything like that. And its powers, uh, in, in the, it, it was so controversial for a reason that, that um, Britons may appreciate, uh, which is, you know, in the United States, we don't really like central governments. In fact, our first experience with the central government was yours, uh, George the Third, 
Wasn't and, much and, liked over here either, I have to say. That's right. Well, so, you know, we made a great fuss about it and we rebelled. But, you know, you, you, you may have read that um, we have a real hard time with national health care, which is just something that other industrial uh, countries take for granted. We don't take things like that for granted. And the same was true with the central bank. Uh, and, you know, all throughout the, the 19th century, we had one uh, very early on and, and repealed it actually twice. And then just every time we would have a, a financial crisis, we would call uh, literally J.P. Morgan to try to, to bail us out. And then uh, by the early 20th century, the country and the financial system are getting a little big, even for one uh, uh, wealthy gentleman uh, to bail us out. And, and so finally, the, the Congress, uh, through much uh, horse trading and, and, and actually some really genuine intellectual debate, created this uh, Federal Reserve. Uh, notice it's not called the Central Bank. It's called the Federal Reserve because they, they constructed it with 12 branches, which was, in their minds, um, a protection against uh, this dreaded ogre of a truly centralized uh, central bank. But they, they did, for, for these political reasons of not creating this, this dreaded uh, monster of a central bank, they made it so weak that it didn't really have enough power. And as we went into the Great Depression, they were powerless. And, and it's, it sounds strange to say, but in the greatest, still the greatest uh, financial catastrophe uh, that we've had in uh, the lifetime of the Federal Reserve and the lifetime of the country, uh, it, it was a, a non-factor, except that it made things worse uh, by uh, raising interest rates uh, uh, too early uh, when we weren't really out of it. So at that point, the Fed was uh, strengthened, and it's been it's been reformed uh, several times since then. Most notably in 1978, when they said, um, you know, the job of the Federal Reserve isn't only the mandate isn't only going to be uh, to keep the dollar, the value of the dollar stable. It's also going to be to promote uh, full employment, uh, you know, which to some people is still very controversial because to some extent those two goals uh, are in conflict. But but we live in a democratic society and, uh, you know, we can't have just uh, uh, promoting hard money and, and no one going to work uh, that, that would do in, in democracy. So. Uh, I think the Fed, to, to get to your question now about whether it's succeeded or not, uh, it's really had three giant misses. Uh, w one was the Depression, and, and I think at that time it was, as I said, somewhat hidebound by, by limitations on its charter. Uh, the, the huge miss uh, was its blindness going into uh, the great inflation of the 1970s. Uh, and uh, I'm sure you saw that uh, uh, a couple of days ago, Paul Volcker died. Uh, Volcker was... Uh, yeah, the, uh, the obituaries I read of him all seemed to be very kind. I mean, they all seemed to think that he was, uh, uh, he'd done a pretty good job while he was yeah. in charge. I'm afraid I wrote one of them, and I, and I agree. Uh, he he um, uh, came in when... It, it's just the, the younger generation may be astonished. Uh, uh, the federal funds rate, the prime rate uh, that the Fed controls, he had to, re inflation was was so high, he had to move it to, to squeeze all the excess credit out of the system. He raised it from 11% to 19%. Home mortgages were 18%. You know, uh, car loans the same. Can you imagine uh, trying to buy a home and, and paying an, an 18% uh, rate of interest? And and he, um, uh, because there was a such an expectation of inflation. Every time a, a union contract came up, they would need an increase to, to make up for the inflation that had just happened and a further increase to anticipate the inflation that would uh, that would occur. And therefore, the businesses had to keep raising their prices to be able to pay these wage increases, which, which stimulated further rounds of wage increases. And we, we were just trapped in this nasty cycle. It, it, many people, I remember this, didn't think it was going to be curable. And so Volcker went to these tremendous lengths to uh, squeeze the liquidity and, and just as importantly, the expectation of liquidity of, 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 of excess out of the system. And, and he did it, he succeeded. You know, and the, the, the proof is that, is that the recent Federal Reserve chairmen have had a problem that we never would have dreamed of. They've tried to create a little inflation and, and, and haven't been able to succeed. It's, it's, it's so astonishing the distance that he's, uh, he 
uh, brought the Federal Reserve and, and largely with him uh, the other uh, central banks. Um, the, the other big miss, I think, was in uh, uh, you know, shock, uh, the mortgage crisis. In my opinion, there, uh, the, the mistake wasn't so much in the manipulation of interest rates, but it was in its role as a regulator. The Federal Reserve is also the banking regulator here, uh, one of them, uh, but the most important one. And uh, you can't allow people to buy homes uh, on 100 percent credit or uh, 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 pretending to have uh, to be solvent, but 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 uh, not having to document their income and all the other abuses that went on. Um, That was asking for trouble and we got it. So uh, with those. uh, uh, So I would say the Fed has done a reasonably good job. Uh, we've had a we had a long period of stability from the 70 late 70s early 80s until the mortgage crisis, and that was larger to the credit of the Federal Reserve and, and some of the other central banks. Uh, but we did have a big miss in 2008. Against that background, um, we have a, a relatively new Fed chairman now, Jay Powell. Um, what do you make of Donald Trump's criticism of the Fed? Well, it's. Uh, exactly what other presidents uh, have done, except uh, it's cruder and, um, and nastier and, uh, uh, you know, in, in that sense, out of line. But, you know, William McChesney Martin was the, the Fed chief who served longest. This was in uh, uh, the 1950s and 60s, about 19 years. And he was a person who famously said uh, that his job was to take away the punch bowl once the party uh, got going. And did, uh, you know, meaning if, if, if the economy is getting uh, too hot, uh, you cool things off uh, generally by draining liquidity, by, by raising interest rates. He did that very well until the mid 60s when the then president, uh, Lyndon B. Johnson, began to put pressure on him. And there's a story actually that Johnson invited uh, 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 Chairman Martin down to his ranch and uh, he invited him for a ride. Uh, Martin was surprised to see that LBJ himself was going to be uh, driving the Jeep. And uh, uh, Johnson began to drive at this reckless pace uh, while Martin is hanging on for dear life. And meanwhile, Johnson is telling him, you are going to take the lower interest rates, aren't you? <laughs> and uh, uh, regrettably, uh, Martin really began to give ground. LBJ wanted uh, cheap money to pay for his uh, so-called twin wars of the war in poverty and, of course, the war in Vietnam. And he began to let the cat uh, out of the uh, the inflation genie uh, out of the bottle. Uh, Arthur Burns, who was um, Nixon's uh, uh, Federal Reserve uh, chairman, uh, was subject to uh, more consistent bullying. Nixon had lost his first run for the presidency in 1960 when uh, when uh, Chairman Martin had raised interest rates, and he was convinced that the Fed. Uh, uh, held the magic key to the elections. He he cared nothing else about the Federal Reserve except that it, it, he was convinced it could cost him the election. We know what lengths Nixon would go to to, to ensure his reelection because he bugged the Watergate Hotel as well. But he put pressure on uh, on Arthur Burns and he, he said to him, he called him in and said, "You see to it, no recession." And 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 Burns complied, uh, and he ran a very um, uh, uh, open uh, liberal uh, monetary policy. And the economy hummed along, and Nixon won in a landslide. But within a year or two, uh, we had a very serious inflation problem, and uh, Burns didn't uh, uh, quite know what to do. So, and 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 Ronald Reagan put tremendous pressure on Paul Volcker. So, what what we've seen from Trump and 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 Jay Powell, uh, you know, is is a, a continuation of that. Only, of course, only Donald Trump would go so far as to call the Federal Reserve chairman possibly a worse enemy than China and so on. So, uh, <laughs> uh, all of the uh, abusive, uh, uh, unlearned uh, uh, nastiness that you expect from the current occupant. This is, the, this is precisely the point, isn't it? I mean, that, that Donald Trump faces a, a re-election, a possible re-election in November 2020. So looking ahead, there could be a new US president in a year's time. Um, if the new president were a Democrat, what do you make of the Democrats' economic policies? Well, um, the Democrats' economic policies uh, go quite far to the left. Uh, that's no secret. I've written it. Others have written it. Uh, 
uh, I think someone added up that Senator Warren has uh, 15 new taxes, I think was, was um, uh, at the last count and, you know, many, many trillions of dollars of worth of those taxes, uh, virtually all coming uh, from the wealthy. It's a very uh, new formula or approach uh, to the United States, which has generally been uh, uh, let the free market do its thing, put up some guardrails, hopefully some solid guardrails to regulate and then redistribute the gains to, uh, uh, you know, for healthcare and social security and uh, other things uh, to bring the rest along. And uh, no one, a few dis dispute that we have to do more to bring the rest along, but some of the Democrats' uh, proposals, uh, uh, you know, in many people's opinion, including mine, go, go too far in the direction of snuffing out the, uh, uh, free market genie that that creates the wealth uh, to begin with, and that would give us the means to to redistribute and so on. You know, we'll see if a Democrat is elected. Uh, a which Democrat? Warren has got quite a lot of pushback, and her her ratings in the polls have fallen uh, recently. Although I have to say, Bernie Sanders's ratings, and he he's just as far left. Uh, his are holding up, uh, but but there's been uh, a fair amount of pushback. Uh, particularly over the health care issue. And there's a, a debate here about whether we should offer uh, government health care uh, uh, to anyone who wants it, or as the candidates on the left uh, would say, uh, uh, enforce it on everyone. And, and the drift right now seems to be with the former, not to make it uh, mandatory. And then, of course, when a Democrat, whatever Democrats elected, uh, they would need uh, Congress to go along. And even... Uh, you know, in today's terms, relatively moderate Democrats, such as uh, Obama, uh, uh, couldn't get nearly all of what they wanted uh, through the Congress. So th there's a long way between uh, policy, campaign policies, and and actual legislation. But but the mood of the country is certainly further to the left mm -hmm. than it was uh, previously. Um, before I let you go, Roger, um, I want to take you back to something you said before about market forecasters. Um, you, you're really quite critical of them, aren't you? Do, you? do you think it's impossible to predict Wall Street stock prices, for example? If you're talking about future prices, yes, I do. Uh, uh, that's a joke. Um, uh, it's just, you, you know, the old adage, uh, which way is the bird going to go when it leaves the tree? I mean, if you try it, it's, you know, it's really hard to do. You might get it right two or three times in a row, but, but you know, it's... It, might have a lot to do with luck rather than skill. There's so many forces that go into uh, predicting uh, an entire market, uh, the direction of interest rates, uh, the movement of various commodities uh, around the world, the geopolitical factors. Uh, we've got these uh, tariff wars now. What's really happening in China and how solid uh, are those balance sheets? Uh, how will demographic uh, factors, the aging of various populations, play off again what is the interplay amongst these factors what will happen in these elections that you've talked about in the u.s and elsewhere and 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 what sort of policies will you know, possible new governments come along with uh, antitrust considerations regarding now in particular silicon valley how do all these factors uh, combine uh, with each other uh, you, you know you just it, it it's it's just tough to be that smart i i think it's very hard uh, but not impossible uh, to size up one business or two businesses or, or five or six companies you have a, a real good understanding of. Uh, uh, but, 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 it, but it's not easy. It, it's difficult. And then to try to say, well, I know which way on average a thousand companies are going to move. Um, it, 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 it's really terribly difficult. Uh, you know, impossible is a big word, but, but um, I've never tried to do it. <laughs> Finally, Roger, when you're not thinking about the financial markets and writing and so on, what do you do in your spare time? What's your hobby? Well, I love to read. Uh, some of it's for work, but a lot of it's uh, for pleasure, both fiction and uh, nonfiction. Uh, my wife and I love to go up to Maine, which is uh, a less uh, populated state than the, than the Boston area, the Cambridge area where we live. Um, 
I like to, to exercise and cycle and take walks and, and have a game of chess now and then um, and um, be with my family and friends. Roger Lowenstein, thank you so much for talking to me. It's very kind of you. Mine is a pleasure. Have a wonderful day. You too. Thank you for listening to the Trading Global Markets Decoded with Daily FX podcast. This podcast is brought to you by IG. Check us out at dailyfx.com. If you love the Trading Global Markets Decoded with Daily FX podcast, we'd love for you to subscribe, rate, and give us a review on iTunes. We'll see you next time. Thank you.